Hello, everyone. We're going to wait two more minutes before we start. I hope you're having a great day so far. I'm Sebastian. I'm located here in Gisborne. I don't know if anyone from Gisborne. There you go. Hello. Hello, hello. How you doing? Evening, everyone. We're just going to give it two more minutes and then we'll start. There's just a few more people coming in. Hi, oh, Sebastian, it's James Irwin here. Um, good to see you looking as enthusiastic as ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, perhaps, perhaps it's because Barry is going to tell us all his knowledge. I'm very excited. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I definitely can't match uh, Seb's enthusiasm. Yeah, uh, can you hear me, Darren Larkin, Gisborne Air? Am I in? <clears throat> you are, Darren, yep. Okay, all good. Just having a few few problems with the computer and Zoom. Just yeah. getting my 12-year-old to sort it out. <laughs> what about me, Ian? Yep, we can I hear you. I can see you. me. <laughs> yes, we can see you and hear you. I just realised my earpods weren't working. <laughs> nice to see you again, Ian. Yes, it seems so long. <laughs> We, we will get started and I will just let people in as they, as they arrive in, so I have to admit them. Um, so, yeah. Hang on, can you close that back window? There we go, ladies and gentlemen. So, welcome to Constraints Let Approach webinar. So, our community development officer, Barry, hi Barry again, located in Manawatu is going to lead this great course. So thank you so much, Barry, for doing this. And thank you all coaches for taking this time. We know it's late at night, so good on you. And in order to have a great Zoom course experience, I will ask everyone now, please, to turn off your camera, if you can do that. So what you need to do is, if you go at the bottom of your screen, you can see an icon that says Stop Video at the bottom of your screen, if you drag your mouse. So everyone, please, you stop your video there. And also, can you press mute? By doing that, the presentation will run much better. There we go. Later on, we will have some activities throughout the course, and we will call it a breakout rooms. So in the breakout rooms, you will have to do the opposite turn on the camera and please um, yeah, unmute yourself in order to interact each other. I repeat once again, for the ones that are joining us, please try to turn off your camera at this stage and mute also your microphone. And during the webinar, um, we are gonna take questions. So for example, we are gonna use our chat. I'm gonna say, Hello from Gizi. So if everyone can write, where are you right now at the moment? In order to try our chat, our chat icon is at the bottom. Can you see what I wrote? Yes, there we go, Napia, woohoo! Nice, Hawks Bay, yeah. Palmy, there we go, Gisborne. Another person, yeah, Darren from Gisborne. Excellent, hi Levin. Excellent. Well done, everyone. And we will try to answer most of the questions, but if we run out of time, no worries, because we are going to record this session, and also we can get those answers back to you during the following week. Also, Barry is going to tell us later how we're going to be in touch in order to keep this presentation alive. So, Barry, all yours. Let's enjoy your presentation. Thank you very much, Seb. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, some fantastic numbers, which is great to see. Um, yes, yeah, so our constraints-led approach webinar. Um, I have a good understanding of the constraint-led approach, but however, I admit I'm not an expert, so there's people that go on to study master's and PhD within this topic. So I'll try and answer every question. If there's something we can't answer, then we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So this is our first webinar. Hopefully, we have no technical issues. 
Uh, we also have Tim Moto from Sports Hawks Bay who's joining us, and that's just him to observe me and give feedback for my own personal development. So if Tim and Seb are put into the breakout room with you later on in the in the webinar, they won't. They'll just be leave the cameras off and mics off. They're just um, they'll be observed and they won't actually be participating. Quick, go through some housekeeping. So as Seb has touched on, if the mics can stay off unless you're in the breakout room. You'll need a pen and paper and possibly your phone to take a picture if there's a lot of information to take down. Uh, we've spoken around the breakout room, so there's two or three breakout rooms throughout the uh, presentation where you'll go into the room and you have a little bit of discussion about what we've talked about. And then as Seb has touched on as well about the chat box for any questions, any burning questions, we'll try and make sure we answer those as well. So what is a constraints-led approach? So the constraints, we're going to talk about the, mainly the task constraints within your practice and then how these can implement, implement into your practice for the environmental factors to help contribute to your player development. So the constraint, which is a boundary which encourages the learner to emerge with certain behaviours. The issue sometimes people have with the word constraint it can be confusing because then it's linked to, to a boundary or a limit. So within later on in the presentation we'll touch on how you can actually reward behaviours. Uh, when can it be used? So it can be used from children all the way through to adults as part of your practice or a full practice. So me, I use it with kids and all the way through to adults within my, uh, within my coaching. You could even use it if you're in a master's team, so maybe not use it on conditioning. Uh, so we've got the why. So research suggests it links to skill acquisition so you can apply what you've learned and in training into the actual game. And then how you do it is you manipulate the constraints to help achieve your outcomes or behaviors, which we'll touch on throughout. So learning outcomes we want to hopefully achieve throughout the presentation. So recognizing the different types of constraints that can be used, how the constraints that approach is linked to skill acquisition, and then a structure to help you create the constraint practices within your team who you work with. So just to start the little icebreaker, you've got 30 seconds to have a look at the screen see how many squares you can count. Once you've come up with an answer, just drop it into the chat box. You have 30 seconds, have a go. Twenty-three. We've got ten more seconds. Nice work. If you got thirty-five, you're correct. So if you just, when you're initially looking at that image, you might have noticed just a few squares, but the more time you get to spend analyzing, the more evident the other squares will become. So this just highlights the perception is different in person to person. So constraints-led approach is similar to the perception. So it's the interaction of the player with the constraints will help support their development. So this is a model from Newell and Davids. Um, if you want to just focus your attention on the middle, you might recognize that player. So that's Lionel Messi. Uh, some people recognize the best footballer of all time. So the player is in the middle and then they interact with the outside. So if you look at the top, we've got the task. So in the game for a task, you could change uh, the rules, the number of players, the size of the field, for example, or the time that it goes on for. You could even change the amount of goals available. If you have a look at the player, so the player is the individual, so everyone's got their own unique set of constraints, so which can be physical, height, weight. An example, last night we had a trial for under 13 FTC boys, and there was uh, one boy was six foot, so he's, he was physically mature like a man, and he was standing beside another boy who was still under 13, but he was maybe four foot ten. So just there's, there's the physical constraint straight away with them two players matched up against each other. And then you can manipulate that in your practice. You might have a big player and you might put them up against like a small technical player. And there'll be different challenges for each one of them. Then you've got your mental attributes. So this can be the experience of the player, uh, their confidence. Uh, an example, if you want to try and 
developmental pressure on your players. Uh, you could use a scenario where they're one nil up with five minutes to go and they need to win the game to win the title. So you're just trying to manipulate the constraint to help support them. And then in the corner, we've got the environment. So the environment is the physical. So that might be the surface, the equipment, your balls, cones. And it's important you manipulate the equipment regularly to try and stretch and challenge the, uh, the players. And then underneath of that, you've got the social cultural. So social and cultural factors impacts development. Uh, so you've got Messi as an example in the image who grew up in South America. So the environment he grew up in, like football is like as a passion and a way of life for like a large majority. And then football is less formalized. So if you think back to when you were a child and you were playing football, for me, it was, it was being in the streets, uh, playing with my friends. And then we used, I can never remember winning 20 nil as a child. Because then we used to adapt it and put in different constraints, put different players up against each other so it was fair and even. So it was less formalized and helping their development. So the focus of this presentation is based around the task constraints. So we've just got a quick video to watch. So this is a rugby example. So hopefully you can hear this and it's clear. Oh, So, what kind of constraints did you notice? So in that short video, we're going to put you into breakout rooms. You're going to have two or three minutes. So stick on your cameras and your microphones and have a quick discussion. What did you notice within that?
So we should have everyone back in. Can you quickly I think, type? I think we are waiting for three others. Okay, perfect. So you can start, to, if you're back in the room, you can start typing in some of the things you discussed, if, there, if there's any key themes. So those that just joined us, we just asked if there's any key themes within your room, can we type them into the chat box quickly, please? Some really good answers there. Some good discussions, well done. So why do we want to use the constraints? So in the constraints-led approach, there's a clear emphasis of discovery learning, which you might have picked up on within that video. He gave the player a problem, and then he had to figure it out. He didn't give them the answer. So that's what we're trying to achieve. We want to encourage problem-solving behaviors. So the players are engaged in the learning rather than passively receiving the information from us. And then this will help develop the behaviors and the skill development. So we've got another video coming up in a second. So we're just going to touch on the isolated versus constraints approach. So have a watch of this video. Here is an example of an isolated ball mastery activity using cones and poles as points of reference for movement. In this activity, players have been asked to dribble the ball. Are We've lost around design. the poles without hitting the cones. The aim is to get it around all poles as quickly as possible. Players have been given explicit instruction to keep the ball close by taking a touch every step and to only use the right foot. Ultimately, what we can see is players perceiving and acting with reference to the poles and cones and also the explicit instruction given by the coach. Both things which are never present in the game. So if you think about that video, straight away the player, the coach is giving the players the how. Now have a quick look at the constraints that approach, how you might adapt that. Here is an example of an isolated ball mastery activity. Switch on. Uh, Here's an Sorry, folks, it's not letting me move on. An example of a constraints based ball mastery activity using an opposition player as a point of reference. In this activity, players are split into two roles. One person is a tagger and the other a runner. The aim of the runner is to avoid getting tagged for 15 seconds. The aim of the tagger is to tag the runner. Both players must be in possession of a football. The environmental and individual constraints stay the same. The task constraints have been manipulated. The size of the playing field, the number of players, the limited use of goals, and both players having a ball, along with the rule change of not being able to tackle and rather having to tag. So if you think about that, the environment that in the isolated practice that the, the kids are placed into, so it's static. So there's a bunch of cones which don't change in the poles. And I've certainly done it as a coach. So I put cones out and I had the kids running through it. And then you give them the explicit instruction where that coach said, you can only use your right foot, take a touch every step. So the environment isn't dynamic. So there's limited um, need for the players to search and make decisions. So their perception system, and then that's limiting their learning opportunities. Whereas in the constraints video, uh, the activity is based in an environment which is always which is changing. So it's dynamic. Uh, there's you've got the tiger present, which acts as pressure. The players are given the freedom to use any type of ball control or touches they want. And then you can see the use different uses of the foot, different touches, so short and bigger touches, different body position, and they're even speeding up and slowing down. So they're constantly searching for the opportunities within that environment. As a result, the perception system is highly active as the players move or towards the opponent. So this is the New Zealand, this is quite wordy. This is the New Zealand 
uh, football's definition of a skill. So for a technique to become a skill, you have to, be, you have to be able to consistently do it in a game situation. So as an example, a player can dribble around the cones, but then struggles to transfer into the game. So if you think about um, how can we then set up an environment in our practice where they get to make lots of decisions and then they can start to implement it in the game. So if we have, so the, if the environment becomes dynamic and fluid with lots of movement, pressure, they're making thousands of decisions and actions in the practice, then we as coaches have to try and replicate that in training, especially if you only have them for one or two trainings a week. We don't really want them standing in lines, dribbling around cones. So this is New Zealand football is what they call the precision uh, decision execution. So the P is your perception. So that determines how you act. So what you see and hear. So that's based on might be how much space or time you have. Then based on this, you, the player makes a decision. So what action do I pass it? Do I run with the ball? Do I tackle? And then finally, they'll execute the action. So in the traditional isolated approach, the focus is only on the execution of it. So it's like a cycle. So if you think about this cycle, it happens over and over, thousands of times in a game or training. So we want to try and develop that unconscious, the mechanism required to, so the player can perceive, decide and execute consistently. So if we look at back to the model, we have Messi in the middle. He's, his perception, decision, execution is elite. He's one of the greatest players. So how can we try, we're obviously not gonna get our players to that level, but it's the environment he came up in different tasks as he, as he was a young player. I can guarantee he wasn't, didn't spend 10 years or five years dribbling around cones and, and within poles. Before we move on to natural constraints, is there any questions for us? Or for Seb, for me? Ten seconds, I'll move on. Perfect, so natural constraints. So if you have a look at that image, so that's the weather and the climate. So it might be wind, rain, snow. So here in Manabu 2, we get a lot of strong winds and this can affect your practice. You might have to adapt. Then we've got you know, the pitch, the surface. So the quality of the surface can have an effect. So if you think of football, I know in Ireland and England, the 80s and 90s, the pitches were terrible. So it was all long ball. They couldn't play on the surface. And now football, the, the quality of surfaces throughout the world is improving and the style of football is improving. Or you might have a, you might have a 4G pitch, uh, different types of bounces. And then you've got the other picture is the environment. So it might be 7v7, 9v9. The formats will, ob will have an effect as well. And then if you have a look at, this is uh, Lukaku, who's a professional player now, similar to the trial we spoke about. This was hit when he was 13, so he's so mature. And then this can have an effect on long-term player development. So if you think of these physical constraints, all they had to do was pass the ball and he could run after it and be more powerful than everyone else. But then there's parts of his game that he wouldn't have got to develop, so receiving in tight areas. So then think about how those constraints can affect your, the players you work with. In manipulate constraints, we've got so the task might be implicit. So we're trying to get to the point where, so the impl implicit learning is unintentional. So a, ta a task implicit might be, an example would be, you simply tell the players the rules and the scoring system, and you just let them play. And then you allow them time to determine the most appropriate way or strategy. So you're not explicitly telling them the solution or what to do. So it's important you consider the questions you want to ask of your players before you design the practice. And then it's easy for you to facilitate the player's learning. Uh, and then if we go, we've got explicit. So this is the coach tells the players the rules, uh, they explain, demonstrate. So they give them the how. So an example might be the coach tells the players, so we're working on possession today. And then they ask them, how might we achieve this before the practice starts? And then the players start to verbalize it. And then that's an example of an explicit learning. And then if you use these approaches, it's not just for the players. So as a coach, and me personally, I'm still learning about this when I use these. So you, you'll help improve you as a coach using this approach. And then as you get better as a coach, the players have a better experience and you'll have a better experience as a coach as well.
And then there's lots of value in individual practice. So that's unquestionable. So these are just player cards that, especially working with junior, uh, junior players, you can give them, so you, you might give them a constraint or a little challenge within that game. So you're not setting everyone the same thing. So it's not saying everyone's on two touch. So you might say, try to score with a header. Um, so you're tasking or constraining individual players within your practice. An example for me, so recently worked with a player and she's a tendency to always play the ball backwards. So she's missing opportunities to receive and play forward. So I constrained her where if she wanted to play back, it had to be on one touch. So rather than telling her she always had to play forward, the constraint still gave her the option to play back, but it made it more of a challenge. So the, the constraint challenged her to get into positions so she could play forward more often. Um, and this was really beneficial to her. I wasn't stopping her completely doing it, but I was just making it a little bit more difficult. So the demands just, just, just relates to the way the coach generates the instructions from which the players work. So that's your session explanation. And then the coach can structure and build tasks around that. So this is um, a way you can design it yourself. So we've got the restrict. So this is more of the traditional way where the coach can constrain the practice. You might restrict ball contacts, uh, player movements or decisions. So this can be good for enabling uh, lots of repetition of your practice theme. So we'll use that example, you must play forward that we talked about that player. And then with the restriction placed on the players, they can only do certain things. Whoever restricting kind of can discourage the player's decision making and then their capacity to kind of learn from the cues and triggers. Whereas we use relate, the players are encouraged to relate uh, the session task provided by the coach to the situation. So an example might be recognize when to play forward so that you're kind of placing the seed in the player's head. So that might be you're not making it a mandate. So the intention is being from relating the task back to the situation. And then you can support this by asking, or well, let's say infrequent, you wouldn't be asking frequent questions to help the players allow to make those decisions. How did you find it tough to play forward, et cetera. And then you can use the reward. So the reward is the behaviors linked to the task. So if you want to encourage, say a team to press early, you might use half a pitch. And then if they can win the ball back in the opposition half and score, we give them three goals. So it's kind of the middle ground between restrict and relate, but the players aren't mandated to do it, but they're likely to have a good go as the reward is greater for them. So this is it split into a session design. So this might be applicable to some of the junior coaches where the topic is attack and wide. You can simplify this. Then if you have a look, you've got the parameter. So the pitch will be in thirds, so vertically. So it's going to be wider than longer. You've got restrict. So must enter both wide areas before scoring. If you want to relate, you'd use wide areas to set up attacks or reward. A goal score from a cross or a pass from a wide area equals two. So if you have a look then on the image itself, you just need to be careful of not over constraining. So You'll see on the left-hand side of the image, the, if the red team have to play into both sides of the pitch before they can score, the blue team, so that player on the right-hand side, might just stand in there because they know the other team have to play into both channels before they can score, and then that will start to affect the practice. So you lose that, that realism. So a possible solution might be the blue team can only defend one channel at a time to stop that player going out there and losing the realism. So just be careful when you're using the constraints that you don't lose the actual realism or what they will come up against uh, when they play the actual game at the weekend. And an out, of, an out of possession example might be, as I said, like an early press, a half pitch, restricted. You say you have to win the ball back in the opposition's half. If you're related, you give them the scenario like earlier. But the reward might be win the ball back in the opponent's half and score, and we give you three. So that's just an image linked to that. So early press, Reds are trying to win it in the, the opposition half, and then we give them three if they score. So we're going to go into breakout rooms again. So 
in your group, so in your breakout room, just pick one of these. So it can be restrict, relate, reward. You can have a go at all three if you want. And we're just gonna put up a few topics. So it can be passing, shooting, dribbling or running with the ball, or counter attacking. And see if you can come up with one of them, what you might use within your practice. No pressure if you can't come up with them at all. So we go for five minutes. So it'll be four minutes and then a 60 second countdown. And then I just might ask someone to feed back. We'll put on a camera. Seb will pick, it, pick someone out of the group. So have a go. So you might, I'll give leave that on for another 10 seconds if you need to take a note. So we've got passing, shooting, dribbling or running, counter-attacking. So you might want to take a photo.
Okay, Barry, do you want me to pick someone so they can share their, their thoughts with us? Yeah, that would be great, Sad. Okay, let me do it from the hat. There we go, maybe David, David Mac McCormkindale. Sorry for my bad pronunciation. Ah, David, there we go. Nice um, to see you. Or, yeah, nice to see you too, sir. Uh, our, our group had a quick talk about um, some restricting ones. So with passing, a couple of the options we looked at or talked about was you could limit the number of touches. So it might have to be a one or two touch pass or a restriction could be that they they can't score until they've done a certain number of passing passes. Um, and uh, similarly with shooting, we again looked at the restricting there. Um, and again, you could limit how many touches they might be able to take uh, before shooting. It might need to be a first time finish. There might be a restriction in terms of where they could shoot from. Maybe they need to be inside the box or there could also be a restriction on who could shoot. Maybe it's only the strikers who could shoot, for instance. Um, and then we sort of started to talk a little bit about rewards, but we'll leave it at the restrict ones. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dave. Yeah, and I think uh, that's a real common one, isn't it, with the restricting of touches. So that's one we need to consider because we've all we've all done it. Um, if you, like, sometimes the tempo might be dropping in the practice and the kids are starting to slow down and we might say, okay, two touch, and it does speed it up a little bit. But then it, we need to be considerate of, of if we're trying to work on maybe maintaining possession in the practice. If we put on a restriction and then it's not linked to the outcomes we want, then that might have an effect. So the ball might just be continuously turning over. So for me, if anyone can take from this presentation, if anything, having to think about what progressions or what restrictions we're putting in place, is it beneficial to the players? Is it important? Is it linked to what we're trying to work on? And then I think that'll be a success if we can just even get that. Good work. And I'm sure everyone else has some really good examples. What I would love to do to make sure everyone tries to have a go at this. So this, you can practice this for a long time, but in the next few weeks, what I'd love to do is send an email out to everyone and have a go at coming up with a restrict relate reward. If you've used it with your team and how did it go? And then what I will do is when people feed back to me through the emails, I'll create a, li a little document. And then once we get that collated, I'll flick that out to everyone. So it might be, I tried, if they make three passes and score, it counts as three goals as a reward. So we, try, we can try and see how many we can get from people. And then it's just like, we can work on that together. I think that would be a really cool um, idea for the group. So, Moving on, just going to give you some examples. So if you use timings as a task, so have a think about what would the consequences be with this restriction. So if you want to restrict it, you might say you have to score within 10 seconds of gaining possession. If you want to relate it, you'd explain to the team um, at the highest level of the game, uh, a high percentage of the goals are scored within eight seconds of gaining possession. So then again, you're sowing that seed. So you want to try and score quickly when you win the ball. And then if you want to reward it, same thing, you go double goals if you score within 10 seconds. So from a session outcome, there's be lots of transitions within the game. If we go more specific, if you want the players to be brave and 1v1 attacking, you could restrict it or you could reward. If you beat a player on the way to a goal without opposition touching the ball, I give you two. If you beat two players, I'll give you three. If you beat three players, we win this game. So you're really encouraging them to achieve that kind of constraint that we want. And if you want to relate that, you could ask the players when you're in a position to go 1v1. If you think it's correct time, you can try and beat them. So it's important to try and encourage the effort and not just the outcome. So the players aren't afraid to try it when they get into the game situation. So minimum, this is going the opposite to maximum touches. So you might say if you're working on dribbling, so it might be minimum touches, right? You might say, so if a player always passes the ball quickly, so maybe someone would feel they're always just play it off one or two touch, then you can start to challenge them saying you have to take four or you might have to take five touches before you can pass. And then you're going to, that'll be more of an individual constraint for them that will help develop their dribbling. So the ball minute list protecting the ball. This is quite a new one, power plays. Um, 
they've been using it as a fella called Russell Earnshaw in England. He works with the English rugby. So you can say if your team score in the first or last minute of the game, you get double goals. So then that helps the concentration and the tempo from the start to the end. So another form of power play is that you might be attacking in one direction and your team score. And on one occasion through that game, they can turn around quickly and grab a ball and attack the other goal. And the opposition must react quickly. So if the team turn around and attack the other way and score, it counts as three. But then if they fail, the goal they just scored doesn't count. So there's a consequence. So if you like the idea of end power plays, there's also someone called Amy Price. Um, I'll flick that at the end. She relates a lot of her. It's called gamification. She links computer games into training and the kids love it. So then we've got the areas of equipment. So you might mark out the zones. You restrict them like the video um, that we're going to observe in a minute. So we're going to observe best practice. So I just need to quickly try and get the breakout rooms open because it's disappeared on me. Give me two seconds. So you're going to watch a video in a, in a minute um, so you can make some notes on your observations to discuss in the breakout rooms. And then I want you to have a look. So we've gone back to this slide here where it says, so the topic he's working on is encouraging playing forward. His parameter will be his pitches and thirds with a larger middle third. And then in your groups, have a look and see if what's he using? Is he using a restrict? Is he using a relate or is he using a reward? <clears throat> And I can't actually get the breakout rooms open. So we're going to have to do this through the chat box. So we'll do this individually and we'll watch the video and then I'll give you two or three minutes to have a think. So take a photo of that if you need. So encouraging playing forward, his pitches in thirds. And what does he use? Does he use restrict, relate, reward? So this is Pete Sturgis. He's the head of foundation within the FA. He uses the constraints led approach quite a bit. So this has been a great game, hasn't it? 10 10, but if you are in this middle area, so you see the white line of cones and the white line of cones, this is the middle area. If you pass the ball back from this middle area, your team loses a goal. You can score in the normal way, so you can add to your 10 goals. But if you are in this middle area, and I'm a blue and kicking that way, if I pass the ball back, it now becomes 10-9 to the yellow team. If you are the yellow team, and you get the ball here, and you can't shoot, you can lay it back to somebody there from this area. If you do it from here, you lose a goal. If I'm a blue player, and I'm in here and I'm kicking that way and I can pass back to my goalie and he can then go forward, you're allowed to do that. But if you pass it into your goalie from here, you lose a goal. You can pass it back to your goalkeeper in that end one. Oh. 11, 10. Eventually, I'm going to stop square passes as well. I'll allow that one. Oh, love it. Perfect. So you have about two or three minutes. Have a quick think. What did you notice? And then you can put it into the chat box. That'd be fantastic. And if anyone wants to put in the chat box and come on camera and have a chat, that's perfect as well. Seb might pick someone, Seb. What do you think? So two or three minutes. Have a note. What did you observe? I've been a spy in one of the groups. I was at Glenn and Ken's group. I, I didn't turn on my camera. And yeah, they had great, great chats so far. So perhaps one of those participants, they, they can turn on the camera and, and, and share, share some thoughts with us. Ah, great. A lot of participants are writing. Perfect.
Some great answers. Well done. Yeah, that uh, green box is really is really important to keep uh, a nice uh, format for your coaching session. So I really like that one. So he was obviously trying to encourage forward passes through his game design. And he put the, re the restrict condition in the central zone, but it still looks like the game of football and the players have to make lots of decisions and they're getting the repetition. But what I love about this practice design is he get he started off with a 10, the score was 10, 10. And when you score, you can add to it. But if you go against the restriction, you just lose a score. Whereas traditionally we've gone, let's use that two touch as an example, because it's quite common Two touch. And then you turn the ball over to the opposition, which never happens in the game. You don't blow a free for taking two touches and give it to opposition. So he's been really, really clever with his game design here. And he just takes the score off, but the game continues. And then he's allowed a little bit where they get up to the end, where they can cut back. So really, really smart practice design. So the next two slides aren't relevant because we didn't get the breakout rooms, unfortunately. And we've had the feedback. So is there anything else you notice within that? So would you, would you agree that it still looked like the game? Yeah, yeah, perfect. So he was thinking, even with his game design, we all know when we put the game design on paper, it looks fantastic, but then you get the kids come and it doesn't start to work. So you need to be really adaptable and have a plan B of how I might actually change that and make sure we still get those outcomes. Because we all know it doesn't quite go to plan all the time. And then I think his it was really clear and concise and easy rules to follow for the players so we'll open it up any questions for me or seb we're nearly finished folks you can get back to your wednesday evening So negatives to constraints-based approach. So we, as we touched on through uh, the presentation, it's just being really aware of how you use them. So the negative can be if I'm using it and it's going against what I'm actually trying to achieve in the outcome or within the player development. It's probably the big one which people uh, misconstrue and use the constraints in the wrong situation. But there's absolutely loads of positives. So if you think about it, it's linked into you're playing the game and training and it's linked back to what they actually go up against on a Saturday. So what the game looks like. Yeah, I agree. So the kids will get used to it and it's easy to adapt. Once you get used to it, you can start adding in different constraints or you, you practice with it. You're not going to get it right. I, as I said, I still use it and I'm still adapting and tweaking as I go. So that's why I think it'd be really cool if we can get like a little, um, PDF document we do together and we could share that out within our clubs so then the coaches can start practicing within it. Yeah, you can definitely uh, over constrain a practice. So that example where they went into the, have to go into two wide areas before you score or it might be one um, you have to make three, pa three passes before you score. And then the player might play one fantastic pass right the way through the opposition. And the other player is standing there, receives in front of the goal. But then they think, oh, I have to make two more passes. They turn around and pass it back twice. So that would be an example of like over constraining. I 
Yes. So you, hopefully to, to you try to design it within your practice, but some things, as I say, might go to plan and there might be something you see and you might just give like a little constraint or even give the, a player an individual challenge. So it's linked down to the coach, but it's also linked to what you see when you're there as the coach. Yep, so removing constraint can be make a can make that creative play and uh, linked into then, then what are we trying to achieve? Is there certain things they need to work on? And that's when you start using the approach. Yep, so yep, it can get quite boring if you're just the kids absolutely love this approach. So uh when I did we did a, a bit of a holiday program and I challenged myself to, to only use this approach throughout the, throughout the session. So if we were, we were working on 1v1 dribbling, so I used an example in the presentation where if you can beat a player and then your team don't lose possession of the ball and you score, it counts to two. If you can beat two players, we give you three. And if you beat three players, your team win that game. So that was dribbling, little reward system. And then if you want to go straight, you have to beat a player, but that might be too much of a stretch at times. So that might be just one player who you feel is always passing and you really want to try and develop them as 1v1. So you'd say, little challenge for you. You don't have to say it in front of everyone. Just pull them aside and say, I want you to try and beat a player before you score. And then other players don't know you've given that, but it's really cool for them. And then lots of different ones, how many passes you make, you can score. So as the kids, the kids are playing the game but they're you're getting the outcomes you want. So they're still playing, and that's what the kids want. They want to go straight into the game. They don't want to stand in lines, passing the ball back and forth, which they don't do on a Saturday. So if you're clever with your design, the kids will absolutely love this approach. And it's good fun as a coach. Yeah, so the length of activities. So if you're setting up like a little game like that, five or six minutes, give them a minute break. And a good way of doing it as well, if you get, so if you've got your team, you split them into two at the start of practice, you might say to team, the red team, okay, today, we want you to work out, playing out from the back, but do it really, really quickly. That's your challenge. So that's your secret challenge. You might say to the blue team, your secret challenge is we want you to press really aggressively and try and win the ball as high up as you can. So now you, you're linking the two challenges. So the Reds are trying to play out, but they'll be under pressure at the weekend, which the other team are doing. And then you say to them after the first break, when you have a drinks break, you say, um, oh, what do you think the Blues are working on? What do you think the Reds are working on? And then the kids are like, oh, I don't actually know. Okay, we play again, four or five minutes. And now they're starting to think about the game. Because when they turn up to a game on a Saturday, they don't actually know what the other opposition are going to do. So now that's a really, really good process for them. And then they start to pick up things on a Saturday. So we will leave it there, folks. I've taken up an hour and five minutes of your time. Uh, so I will follow this up with an email. But please, please try and have a go at this. It mightn't work the first time, but I can guarantee you the kids will love it. The adults will love it. Whoever you're working with will love this approach. And you you will have my email on my phone. Feel free to reach out and touch me and get in touch any time, and we'll have a chat. So we'll do that in the next few weeks. So we'll just quickly go through the summary. So we want to try and create that implicit environment. So the constraint that approach is fun and it's a real memorable learning opportunity for the players. We want to make it purposeful, so we put that into our practice, and that's the main thing. Make it fun and exciting so the players want to come back for more. And that is just some further reading if you want to find any more information, some podcasts and some more people. So thanks so much, everyone. Reach out if you need any support. Really appreciate you taking your time out this evening to spend it with me and Seb. We've really enjoyed having you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, guys.
Nice to see you. Gracias, guys. <laughs> De nada. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great idea, idea Barry. Yeah. Creating that PDF, all the coaches are going to be able to use that. Yeah, you're up first. You can send me one by the weekend. <laughs> that, that further information, Barry, you, is, can we access that somewhere that you've just got on the screen now? Uh, yes. So, yeah, message me. So that's yeah, just... Now. They're all on Twitter, and then on the right, they're podcasts. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. I might just finish writing down. I can, give it, I can send you a screenshot and email, no problem. Oh, yeah. yeah that's fine. Yeah. I forgot to, gave, uh, to give uh, two awards tonight. The Chess Player Award to James Arwin. He got 35 boxes. Yeah, he did, he did well. I will, I will send an email to him later, and then... The coaching against the odds to Glenn Whitley. He was inside his car, oh, inside his car during this course. So, bravo! <laughs> nice. 